morning, church. My name is Ryan White. I'm the family pastor here at River's Edge, and it is my joy to open up God's Word with you today. You can be praying for uh, Pastor Mike Higley, our lead pastor. He and his wife, Robin, are flying back from Hawaii as we speak, so pray for them as they adjust back to normal life. If you have a Bible, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 16. If you need a Bible or a pen to fill out your sermon notes, raise your hand. One of our amazing ushers can get you what you need. Uh, they can be yours for the service. They can be yours forever. Uh, whatever you need, uh, we want to allow you to be able to dig in and to engage uh, as much as you can. Uh, but before we dive into the next chapter of our sermon series, I actually want to invite up the Webb family to come up to the stage. So, this is Brian and Katie and their son Ty, and I first met the Webbs on Halloween last year. And if I remember correctly, Brian and Ty were in matching Spider-Man outfits. And I think Katie was a cat. I'm not sure. But we are, uh, we're, one of our number one outreaches as a church every year is our Harvest Festival. It's an opportunity for us to really love our neighbors and invite them onto the campus. And the first time I met them was at the Harvest Festival. And I wanted you guys to share just why it was that you showed up, what your experience was like, and why you then plugged in to the church afterwards. So here you go. All right. Good morning, church. Let's give it up for our great music here. Woo. And our pastors are fantastic. Um, well, we saw the signs actually first posted out front of the church, um, you know, with all the buzzwords, bounce house, barbecue, <laughs> love, joy, Jesus, all the good stuff. And so we said, oh, we should probably go check that out. And, uh, and we did. Uh, amen. Amen. And uh, we first met uh, Ryan, and, and uh, Pastor Phil was there, too. Um, thank you. And uh, they just were so welcoming to us, uh, being uh, neighbors. And uh, we said, well, we should probably check out a service, you know. Uh, and we did. <clears throat> and, uh, and we came, and, and Ryan was actually uh, preaching that day. We thought it was his church. <laughs> uh, you know, Pastor Mike, all, all apologies, but... Uh, so anyway, the, the joy for us has been all of you um, and uh, the wonderful kid program that is here. Uh, there's a lot of kids that come to this church, which for us with Ty is uh, a joy. Uh, so we're really blessed, and um, if we could all show up for the, the, new, uh, the Harvest Festival coming up, that'd be great because there's probably you know, other folks out there like us who are looking for a home, and, uh, and we found a home. Yeah. So, thank you. Anyway, uh, and in uh, in honor of our spiritual friendship, Ty has a gift for Pastor Ryan. Yes, what do you have? Give me a sign. Come on. Give me the greatest spiritual Ooh. friendship nice. of all. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so, uh, at the beginning of the sermon series, we said that spiritual friendship is like life's the Christian life's special sauce. And I have been loaded up on hot sauce today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ebs. So they were neighbors who saw the sign, saw the party, and came to check it out. And now Katie serves in the nursery. Brian's on our welcome team. They have found a home here. And it was all because we chose to throw a party on Halloween, not for any other agenda, but then to love our neighbors. So if you want to get involved, uh, we're accepting candy donations. We're going to be running booze and whatnot. Just encourage you guys to plug in this Halloween as we love and serve the community as Jesus would. So if you have a Bible, chapter 16 of the book of Acts, we'll begin there. When I was a boy, I think I was about 10 or 11, I went to a Christian men's conference with my dad called Promise Keepers. Does anyone remember Promise Keepers? It was like a thing in the 90s. It was this spiritual movement that was geared towards building up men 
with integrity and sending them out to go be blessings in their families, in their workplaces, in their communities. And my dad let me tag along to this conference, and it ended up being an incredibly formative moment for me uh, as this young follower of Jesus. And I can say that because I w- even though I was only 10 or 11, I remember a ton of what happened at that conference. And I remember I got to hear Dr. Howard Hendricks, who I think is a professor of Christian history or Christian leadership, and he made this statement that has stuck with me. And he said, every person needs to have three individuals in their life. You need a Barnabas, you need a Paul, and you need a Timothy. Now, if those names don't mean anything to you, Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy were, were early Christian missionaries. There were these friends and companions in God's kingdom who had as their mission bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Roman world. And we can read of their story in the book of Acts, and we hear mention of all of them over the course of Paul's letters. But what's he saying? What was Dr. Hendricks saying when he said you need a Paul, a Barnabas, a Timothy? Let's start with the Barnabas. You need a Barnabas. And this is in your sermon notes, so you can have this for your reference. You need a Barnabas. You need a spiritual friend who loves you, but is not impressed by you. You need a a peer who's willing to keep you honest and who will speak into your life. A Barnabas is the type of friend who keeps you accountable. And this was actually the role Barnabas, the original Barnabas, played in the life of the Apostle Paul. I think his real name was Joseph, but everyone called him Barnabas, his nickname, which means son of encouragement. And that's what he was. He was this encourager. He was Paul's best friend, and he was Paul's fiercest advocate. But also, he was not shy to call Paul out when he thought Paul was out of line. And in fact, we see in the pages of Scripture, there's a fight that the Scripture records between these two buddies. And if you ask me, I think Barney was actually the one in the right. And this is, yeah, Barney. We can call him Barney. We're friends. We'll get spend eternity with him, so you know. But this sort of a friendship, this kind of peer-to-peer spiritual friendship, this should start to sound familiar to you if you've been with us these last few weeks Because this is just the sort of ground we've been covering in this series on spiritual friendship. We saw it with David and Jonathan. We saw it with Joshua and Caleb. But remember, it's only part of the story. You need a Barnabas, but you also need a Paul and a Timothy. So you need a Paul. What does that mean? You need an older person who is willing to build into your life. This isn't someone who's smarter than you, or more gifted than you, or someone who has everything in their life together. I don't believe that person exists. We're kind of all in process. But this is someone who's been down the road a bit, the road of life. They're a mentor who's willing to share with you not just their strengths, but also their weaknesses. Not simply their successes, but their failures, too. And what they've kind of learned in the laboratory of life. A Paul is that type of friend that you want to imitate their faith. You want them to be a model for you. And finally, you need a Timothy. You need a younger person into whose life you are building. Someone to take under your wing and to affirm and encourage and teach, and and pray for, and correct and direct through life's opportunities and challenges. And this is actually just the sort of relationship that the Apostle Paul has with a young disciple that he meets in the city of Lystra, which is in Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey today. He's this mixed-race kid with lots of promise named Timothy. And he becomes kind of Paul's protege, the one he's mentoring. So if everyone needs in their life a Barnabas, a Paul, and a Timothy, I have a question for you. Do you? Pause for a moment and and take inventory. 
Do you have these sort of spiritual friendships in your life? And if not, why not? Now, it's easy to kind of think, well, people haven't just been that friend to me, whatnot. Well, the best wisdom I've actually heard on this is if you want friendships like this, you have to be a Barnabas, you have to pursue a Paul, and you have to mentor a Timothy. You see, Christian communities are not found, they're built. Spiritual friendships are not discovered, they're forged. And it seems that it's in the doing that there is finding, right? You want to Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy, be a Paul, or be a Barnabas, pursue a Paul, mentor a Timothy. And so this morning, we're actually going to wrestle with that Paul and Timothy sort of friendship this morning. We're going to dive into scripture and see what this sort of cross-generational mentorship looks like. So we're going to look at Paul and Timothy's actual story, their friendship, and it begins in Acts chapter 16. So read with me. We'll be starting off in verse 1. So Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, the nearby city. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. So, over the course of Paul's apostolic career, he had this thing where he would go on these long missionary journeys. And he'd usually set out from kind of the Israel-Palestine area, and he'd head northwest, and he would go up towards, through modern-day Turkey, what was called Asia Minor, over to Greece, and then usually he'd sometimes go farther out to Italy or Spain before turning back around again. And now he's on his second big missionary journey. He's in his late 30s, early 40s, and he is doubling back to the city of Lystra, to a place that he's already been to. And this is really, it's 230 miles out of his way. He's making this about face to go to this place. Why? Well, because there's this young man there, Timothy, who is a, a recent convert. He just became a believer the last time Paul and Barnabas came through the city. And a report has reached him that this kid is just full of passion and potential and gifts, and, and maybe he has all that would be required to be helpful for Paul in his kingdom work of bringing the good news of Jesus to all these cities and places that God has called him to. So he makes this about face and he goes out of his way to go grab Timothy and to bring him along for the rest of his journey. And we read this. And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered, Paul and Timothy, to them, to the folks they were talking to, the observances, the observance of the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. That's a conversation for another day. But here was the result. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So there's more here that we won't necessarily touch on, but I want you to notice all that's talk here about Timothy being from a mixed religious home. You see, his mom Eunice and his grandmother Lois kind of raised him, and they were devout Jewish women who who loved God and ultimately came to place their hope in Jesus, but they had raised Timothy in the Hebrew Scriptures. They had kind of trained him up in the ways of Israel's God. And so that's part of who he is. But the other thing is his dad was not Jewish, ethnically or religiously, and he was a Greek. And he worshipped the pagan gods of Greek and Rome, and, and he didn't accept... Uh, Timothy being Jewish. He refused him the mark of circumcision, which is kind of that key identifier of Jewish faith. So Timothy grew up in a family where the marriage itself was a scandal to the Jewish side, this interreligious marriage, and where his father kind of rejected his faith that he grew up in. 
So he grew up as this mixed race, mixed religion kid who's kind of uncomfortably straddling two worlds, right? And what happens? In rolls Paul, he circumcises Timothy, and he brings him on along on his mission of preaching the good news of Jesus to both Jew and Greek. So, and he doesn't circumcise Timothy because he needs to be circumcised to be saved or anything like that. That wasn't Paul's practice. He didn't circumcise non-Jewish believers. But it seems to be that he's restoring Timothy's Jewish identity. He's equipping him uh, to minister in both communities fully and out of both sides of himself. It's really this curious and special moment where he kind of, speaks into his identity, he he kind of launches him on his path. And that's how the friendship starts. And from this point forward, these two men have this deep bond of understanding and mutual trust. And Timothy becomes to Paul like the son he never had. And he serves as his chief lieutenant and his spokesperson in the cities of Thessalonica and Corinth and Ephesus. He'll show up five more times in the the book of Acts, and Paul will mention him 18 times over the course of his letters. And in fact, sometimes it seems that he's the co-sender or even the co-writer of some of Paul's letters. But just imagine what this friendship that sparked here was like for this young man. This man came alongside of him, mentored him, loved him. So that's their friendship at the beginning. But I want to equip you to be a friend like Paul. So to do that, we're going to have to dive into their actual writings, their conversations to each other. And in Scripture, we have two letters that are from Paul to Timothy. And we're going to turn there this morning to look for insight on how to be a friend in this way. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. What do you notice there? My true child in the faith. That word true there in the Greek is almost a technical term. It's a word to describe a kid that was born in wedlock. One that is a legitimate son in line legally to fully inherit from his father. Paul is saying, genuinely, you are my child. Sure, I didn't father you biologically, But in Jesus, we're family. We're spiritual friends united in and through and under the trustworthiness and the faithfulness of Christ. And just imagine how significant that was to hear from Timothy. This young man who has spent his entire life feeling illegitimate, right? From a a scandalously interreligious family He's not Jew, he's not Gentile. But instead, Paul says, you are my true-born child in the faith. Even though you were rejected by your dad, your faith was rejected, you felt like you never fit, you are a genuine child. And I am your spiritual father and you are my spiritual son. All that I have in Christ will be yours. He says something similar in 2 Timothy, his second letter, written years and years later at the end of Paul's life. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This time he says, you are my beloved son. You're esteemed. You're a favorite. 
You're someone who's held in deep affection, loved with a God sort of love. Remember, that language is actually what God the Father speaks over Jesus from heaven in his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. What's Paul doing here? Well, let's just call it what it is. This is grace. Grace actually takes us to that greeting that's in both letters. To you, Timothy, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. You may think it's just a a throwaway line, something spiritual to say at the beginning of a letter, but it actually sums up their friendship perfectly. To you, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus, his Son. So when Paul says grace, mercy, and peace, there's kind of two meanings implicit in those words. The first speaks to God's orientation towards us. He's oriented towards us in grace and mercy and peace. And the second kind of speaks of our embodiment or reflection of each of those in the Christian life, of our call to be channels of God's love, grace, and, or grace, mercy, and peace into the lives of others. And that is what Paul does in this friendship. He's pouring out the grace, mercy, and peace of Jesus into the life of this young man. And let's see how we, he does that. First, he invests in Timothy by extending grace. He extends God's grace to him. That goodwill and that loving kindness and the favor that God shows us when we don't deserve it, he shows that to Timothy. He goes far out of his way. Don't forget, he went 230-something miles on foot to recruit this guy, to restore his identity and to lavish him with love and praise. He extends unmerited favor to Timothy as he as he turns him to the pursuit of Christ and as he essentially adopts this broken passionate young man as his spiritual son he extends him grace second he invests in Timothy by inviting him into the mission of mercy he invites him into the mission and if you know anything about Paul his heart broke for the hurting and the lost, the isolated, and the beat down, any of those who were oppressed and burdened by guilt or shame or sin or error. Essentially, Paul's heart broke for what God's heart breaks for. And he had devoted his life to extending the help of God, the comfort, the freedom, the forgiveness, the mercy that Jesus offered. And what he does is he invites Timothy into that mission with him. To put kind of God's powerful compassion to work in real and tangible ways. To extend grace, he invites him into the mission of mercy. And finally, he embodies peace. He embodies Christ's peace for Timothy. So peace in the Greek is arene. And it doesn't just speak to, like, the absence of conflict. It's not something that's bestowed. At the heart of that word peace is this sense of of joining. You are literally, when you find peace, you are joined to the wholeness and the life of God. And this, this is what Paul's embodying for Timothy. He's joining himself to this young man. He's in for the long haul. He's dwelling with him through life's seasons and life's journeys. And he's giving him his time, wisdom, and affection. They're dwelling together. They're joined together. And he's embodying the peace of God. And so that's why at the beginning of these letters, he says, to you, Timothy, God's grace, mercy, and peace. It sums up their friendship in a simple greeting. To you, my true child in the faith, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. 
It's what it means to be a Paul, to be a mentor, to be a friend like this. We extend grace, we invite into the mission of mercy, and we embody Jesus. It's not something we muster, it's something we channel, that we've received from God that then we pour into other people's lives. We pursue and we love like Jesus. We invite them to join us on our journey as we put God's call to work in tangible ways. And we dwell with people. We share our lives, the lessons we've learned, our affections, both in season and out of season, when we're doing well and when we're falling on our face. And we do this because God's church works better when older believers invest in the lives of younger believers. Remember, it's the special socks of the Christian life. This is what we're meant to be. Everyone needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. And now I'm going to welcome Philip, who decided to dress like me today.
this, like chose to, to, to be sad with me when things were hard. And we got to celebrate the victories and the beauty and the wonderful parts of life. And, and over that time, each of these men had told me that the expectation is as they mentored me, the expectation was that I got to do that for other people. So starting at about the age of 15, I had groups of two or three guys that I would meet with and talk with. And, and for the last almost 18 years, I've gotten to, to minister and encourage younger men right, to take steps in their faith because someone took a risk. And someone took a chance on me, right, when it was probably not always fun. <laughs> and I'm sure at 18 and 19, I knew everything. <laughs> so there was nothing really they could teach me. I was mostly teaching them at that point. Uh, but, but over the course of that, they chose to be for me. And, and so what I want to do is I want to share some of the words of wisdom that, that I've kind of taken in over the last 20 years about what it means to say yes to being in this type of relationship. So I, I was supposed to start with the practical steps, but I'm not. So I just want to warn you. I need you to make eye contact with someone near you. Do it real quick and say, I'm sorry. At some point, we're going to say something to each other. Right. Just apologize in advance for the awkwardness. Just get it out now. Right. This is why Pastor Mike doesn't let me preach or only when he's gone because I make people talk to each other. All right. You guys ready for this? All right. First off, let's let's throw up point number one. I didn't even notice they were on the back slides last time. You are not responsible for your friend's faith journey. Say, I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible. No, gross. Say, I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible. Who is responsible? No, Jesus is. I'm a them and Jesus, right? I'm going to help you out. So it's not like if Jesus is right here in this front row and, and, I'm, and I'm like Paul to, and Ryan's Timothy, right? Like I'm not the go-between. You know what I am? I'm this dude like helping him move forward closer, right? Right? His faith journey, it's not my responsibility, right? The men who mentored me, I was not their responsibility. They chose to love and encourage me, but they did not bear the weight of my transformation in Jesus. Okay, first off, are you responsible? No. Here, but I'm going to get back to it because there are some things you're responsible for, but you are not responsible for their faith journey. Second, Second, let's get the next one. Okay, who here loves, who here thinks they know all the answers? I mean, not really, but like thinks kind of that. Who kind of thinks they know all the answers? Okay, the three of us. Okay, we can go pray afterwards. All right, you won't have all the answers. Look at the person next to you and say, you don't know the answers. Not all of them, but you know some. Here's what, here's what. So many people, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, hey, can you go like grab that person and just, they want to just talk with someone right? You don't know all the answers, right? You don't. It's not your job. Guess who does? God. So what's your job? Your job is to move people closer to who? You or Jesus? Jesus. So move them closer. Go back and sit down. Go back, right? So your job is not to have all the answers. Your job is to be so committed that if you're not sure, come ask someone who might have an idea, right? right? Or be like, I don't really know, but that's a great question. Let's read the whole Bible together and see if we can find the answer. You know what I mean? Right? That's the right answer. Your job isn't to be an expert. There are not experts in Jesus' kingdom. There are brothers and sisters chasing after Jesus. So take that weight off. Come on, grab your shoulder. Just take it off. Take that weight off. And one more excuse down the hole. All right, third one. Let's go. You don't replace God in their life. Say, I don't replace God. Don't replace God. If you feel like I'm being repetitive, I am on purpose, right? But here's your responsibility. You have to commit to pointing them towards God's will, right? You have to commit to pointing them towards God's will. You say, I cannot change someone's heart. You can't even change your, your own heart. How could you change someone else's? That is so delusional, right? Take that weight off. The call is saying, here's God's best, right? When I meet with a young man who's struggling with some sort of like sexual addiction or something like that, I don't like walk in and be like, hey, I can fix this. I'm like, God has something greater than settling for your own pleasure, right? There is something greater and more beautiful that's God's will in that area, Right? There's something better, right? I'm not pouring on the guilt. I'm not pouring on the shame. I'm saying, hey, move forward. There is something greater. Turn from that. So I'm going to tell you, I've been down that road, and that road sucks, and that road leads to regret, 
And I don't want you to walk that road. I want you to walk a road of joyful, victorious living. Amen? Right? So your responsibility is to continue to point them towards God's will in their life. You got it? Say God's will, not mine. God's will, not mine. Say God's will, not mine. God's will. All right. See if you can remember that this week. Okay? Next. All right. Number five. No, four. I'm, I'm, I was a history major. This is clearly difficult to count to more than this many fingers for me. All right, know when you're in over your head. So there was a young man that I discipled when I was first starting out, and we would just meet over and over, and we were getting nowhere quickly. And, and like, I stayed too long in that discipling relationship, right? There are moments and things that happen in people's lives that they need some professional help in. And like in a good way, right? This is part of it. Like there are people that God has gifted uniquely to help some deep things heal in their life. So I need you to know, like, if you're coming up against the same thing over and over and over again, and you're like three to five meetups and that's not changing, I, I, I generally have a policy that I refer someone to a counselor at that point because I'm not a counselor, right? Like, I don't know how that stuff works. I'm someone who can point someone towards God's will. And if, they're, and if we're pointing someone towards God's will and there is some sort of break there that we can't get past, I need to send them to someone who can. Amen? Does that make sense? So know when you're in over your head because you're not responsible for that person's faith, right? Right? You do not know all the answers. So clearly that means you're going to need some help. Amen? Okay, remember that. All right, next one. Whatever it is. Is there one more? Yeah, there is. There's one. All right. I want to encourage you. I want you to know that it may be for a season, right? This uh, Saying yes to mentoring someone is not a death sentence, right? It's not like... It's not like back in the day when you volunteered for kids' ministry, right? And it's like, until you die, you're watching kids. You know what I'm talking about. Like, I grew up in the church. It was, it was like, dangerous. You want to teach Sunday school? Like, 50 years later, I'm still teaching Sunday school, right? It, it's a, you just got to, you're like, fearful at that point, right? We don't do it that way. Praise be to God, right? <laughs> I'm serious, right? So I want, I want to encourage you. It may be for a season, right? Over the course of the last 20 years, I've had about seven or eight men who have chosen to stand in that place, and choose to be for me and continually point me back to God's will. When I wander this, you'll be like, hey, Philip, God's will's that way. And I'm like, okay, right, I'll, I'll try, right? And, and so know that it may be for a season. There's a couple of these folks that I even talked to in the last five years, right? Guess what? Eternity, where we're spending with Jesus and everyone else who loves, like, in him, like, that's a long time. Like, you have plenty of time to catch up later, right? They weren't God to me, but they were for what God was doing in me. Amen? Does that make sense? All right, those are some kind of words of wisdom for you. Um, and I want to get to some practical steps. First, okay, let's go to the practical steps. All right, I'm going to encourage you, start praying for Timothy. Now, I'm going to give one caveat. This is not like, hey, pastor, I'll pray about it, which just is a Christian way of saying no. Right? I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. Like, oh, Jesus, I'll pray about doing what you already told me I'm supposed to do. It's not that, right? The command is not if you feel like it. Or if it works in the season, or if it won't, it can be you watching Dancing with the Stars, right? Like, the call is to be a Paul for someone, right? You don't have to know all the answers, all that kind of stuff. You just have to choose to be for them. So, so first off, start praying for someone, right? That, that, that God would put someone across your path that would be the right person for you to invest in. Now, if God's already told you who that person is, don't pray about it. Just go be obedient, right? If God already says go do it, then just go do it. Does that make sense? Right? And I'm just going to, like, model this real quick. Don't be weird. Don't be like, do you want to be my Timothy? <laughs> well, my name's Mike. Well, do you want to be my Timothy? <laughs> Don't be weird. Right? Here's what you do. You're like, hey, Jesus loves you, and I want to be for what Jesus is doing in your life. Can we grab coffee? Or for you really weird people, let's go to the gym and work out together and talk. I, I don't know how you do that because I'm breathing so hard the three times a year I go there, right? But, but, but find, this is kind of our second point up here, right? Find a way for your life to intersect with that person. Maybe you both like walking, so you walk and talk. Like for some guys, I, I loved playing basketball back in the day when I could run and jump and do things like that. So like we go and play basketball together and like do a Bible study with three or four of the guys after playing ball together, right? Some people love to eat, so you go eat. Or I don't know if you like digging holes, right? Go find a hole to dig together. I don't know what you like to do. But find some ways for your lives to interact and do some things that allow them not just to see and hear what you're saying, but to see you model that out in everyday life. Does that make sense? 
I think I have one more. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'd actually do it. So number three, start the journey with the person. And here's what this looks like, right? First, you got to know their story. Don't just walk up and be like, I'm going to fix you. Trust me. Don't do that. That's creepy and weird. And say no if someone asks you to do that, right? First, hear their story. Like, hear what God's been doing. Hear their spiritual timeline. Hear those highs and lows of their spiritual life. Because only in knowing their story can you help them really understand what God's will is for their life. Does that make sense? Second, learn about their passion. Hear what they're passionate about. Here's what God, hear, ask them what God's already spoken in their life and point them towards that point in those places for God's will for them. Third, just be for them. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to like, honestly, it is incredible to know that someone is just for you, not because you're doing anything for them, but just because they choose to be for you, right? We live in a world where that doesn't happen, right? We think time is money. I'm going to let you know that is antithetical to Jesus's kingdom. Time is not money, right? Time is God's precious gift, right? And our heart and our encouragement is something we freely give, not because they can give you something back. Now, Pastor Ryan's going to talk about what the fruit of these kind of relationships are, and it's incredible and beautiful and worth the awkwardness of asking someone out for coffee, right? But, but be for them. And then, and then lastly, just encourage them to grow towards God, right? There's this great parable that Jesus talks about that, that, that we do all the work in the field. We get to take out stones. We fertilize, but God gives the growth, so find any way you can to encourage God's growth. And Pastor, why don't you come and uh, talk about what that looks like as they finish up their race together. Yeah. So the church works better when older believers are investing in the life of younger believers. Everyone needs a Barnabas, a Paul, and a Timothy. And we get in Scripture, we get to see what this sounds like. In these two letters, in First and Second Timothy, we get to hear a decade, 15, 20 years in what being for, Paul being for Timothy, sounds like and the fruit that it has in his life. So I want to just read you and let these wash over you the words that he speaks over this man as they go into this friendship. So this first passage, it's, it's being written to him, Timothy, when he's a young pastor in the city of Ephesus. And this is what Paul writes to him. And just let this kind of relationship wash over you. He says, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all might see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearer. That's what being for someone looks like. And here is the second letter. And Timothy is now, he's a bishop in the early church. He's a big head honcho. And Paul is at the end of his race. He's about to be martyred. He's writing from a prison cell in the city of Rome. And here's what he writes. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I might be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard 
the good deposit entrusted to you. And what a gift Timothy received from Paul. What a gift. What a blessing. That is the power of spiritual friendship. And I love that image. He returns to it twice of that the laying on of hands. You know, what we do with our hands sometimes have power symbolically. We raise them to receive from the Lord in worship. Here, Paul and the elders are laying their hands on Timothy, and they're saying, all that we have is yours. God, stir up the gifts. Bless this man. We pour out what we've received. We pour out. And then I love that at the end of the race, it's like, okay, God's lifting my hands. Now fan into flame that gift that's in you. Because it's not just you and I. There's the spirit of God here. And that's a spirit of love and power and self-control. And when you partner with Jesus, we will go out and change the world for his glory. Because the spiritual life looks better when we are friends in Jesus. It's the special sauce, right? It's the secret sauce. You need a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy in your life. Because we live under the friendship of God, and it is in friendship that he sends us out to be his people. Let me pray for us. Dear God, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the model. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the challenge. May we be Barnabas. May we pursue a Paul. May we mentor a Timothy, God, because this is the way of life, and you have called us into this. We love you. We praise you. Equip us to be your people, united in love and blessing to one another and our community. We pray this in Jesus' name.